Hello, good morning. Welcome, everybody. I guess we'll get started. For the past two years, Web3 and NFTs have been massive buzzwords in the mainstream media and in crypto headlines. At the same time, crypto, or at least some of it, some of the discussion about crypto, fell to the wayside as an onslaught of bad news about Ponzi schemes, scams, and regulatory enforcement pretty much cast crypto into a negative light. In my opinion, this hasn't been the case for the ideology surrounding Web3 and the various conceptualizations of NFTs. And while the euphoria around Web3 and NFTs has kind of died down, I've got a sense that a lot of interesting things are still happening behind the scenes. So that's what we intend to explore today. With our guest, we'll talk about their thoughts, their concerns, and some of the new developments that are taking place in the blockchain world, but viewed through the lens of music, film, and entertainment. So we've got our lovely guest here, Ed Hill, Senior Vice President um, at Beatport, the worldwide home for electronic music. DJs, producers, and their fans. We've got Finn Martin, founder of Define Creative, which is a media creative agency which connects brands to the latest technology and content. And we've got Julia Maresca, founder of Public Pressure, a platform that employs artists by connecting them directly with their fans and allowing them to control their work and their revenue. So let's get into it. At this moment in time, and this is a question for all of you, what is the most exciting thing in Web3 right now? What's happening in the entertainment industry that most people are completely unaware of? You sure? No, no. Ladies first. I think we are both, we were talking before, we are both a really creative person. I work in fashion for many years, and Web3 is a space for creative people to allow them to create amazing things in different industries. Like, uh, for example, we're working with the fashion brand Diesel, and we're doing a drop uh, about uh, uh, discovering emerging artists uh, and using Diesel uh, brand to be discovered to new communities uh, and, uh, and new fans. So I think it's a huge space where creative people can, can be jumping, and I know it's, as you said about the band narrative, everyone is kind of scared what to do in Web3. They don't know what to do. They know that it's the future, but they don't know what, how to do it and what to do it. And I think creative person like me and you can help them to, to bring them on board and do something new and really creative. That, that's what I think. Well, I would say personally, um, I'm most excited Really, truly, and I mean it, to be here at Pocket of Decoded right now with you guys. Um, it's a big honor to be uh, opening up the main stage here. And I think this event shows that it's really about the community, you know, everybody coming together, um, creating uh, new tools. Uh, and, and yeah, that's what I'm really personally really excited about. Uh, yeah, I think I'm excited about the fact that there's a kind of parallel or sort of X going on with all the conversations about the regular kind of streaming platforms uh, and artists struggling to make ends meet and become artists with the way the kind of current model works and with the new kind of Web3 technologies that we're trying to implement and experiment with, you know, there's that kind of cross path of these. And I think there's a real kind of opportunity there to, to find a way for artists to kind of apply their trade and, and, and be able to kind of build their product without actually kind of having to rely on these kind of algorithms and, 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 the, and the majors, kind of that system that's in place that's obviously, you know, not ideal for everyone. Right. Well, Julia mentioned narratives, and I'm sure all of you are aware of narratives in crypto. Crypto is very trendy. Uh, finance itself is very trendy. There's boom and bust cycles. Every single kind of micro bull rally or breakout within the crypto market is led by some sort of narrative, whether it be liquid staking derivatives or staking and DeFi or Bitcoin utility, so on and so forth. You know, the whole space is kind of situated on narratives. 
And um, we know that what blockchain, what Web3, what crypto really needs is mass adoption, right? We need product to market fit. We need corporations to kind of uptake this revolution and build products within the blockchain space. So what are your thoughts on mass adoption in Web3, really corporate adoption within Mass3, uh, within Web3, I'm sorry? What will it take to make that happen? I think it's not uh, about uh, talking about the technology because uh, the mass adoption, they don't know how the phone is working or Google, Google Map is working, they're using it. So we need to create product easy to be used from the user, but given the benefit that you can have only Web3. Should be really easy for the user, it shouldn't be complicated. We shouldn't talk about wallet or bridging, uh, bridging or doing complicated technology things. They get scared as soon as you talk about wallets to people. So it needs to be a really easy experience there as using Instagram. Yeah, and it's really about, like, so we're, Define Creative, we're a Web3 venture builder, so that's actually what we do, right? We uh, lead brands and institutions into Web3, and really for us, our daily business is to kind of have these conversations, look at a brand's DNA, and then see how that can translate into Web3, what are the benefits they can reap from that ecosystem, and... Yeah, it's really about um, having these conversations and, and, and bridging the gap. And um, I think we're really, we're at a very exciting point because of course there's skepticism, but really it's just the beginning of this journey and it's for the next stage. So we're, I think it's a really, really good stage. I think it's also about trust, right? And, and getting in it for, for the long game and showing that, you know, you're not in it for one or two drops and then you're out. It's like, <clears throat> Try not to focus on the kind of revenue generation is actually by building community and then seeing what comes from that. But that has to be a kind of long-term plan uh, and it has to show that brands are getting in there and they're going to stay in there for, for, through the thick and thin. How can brands build a product or a platform that's authentic and appeals to what the customer wants? I know Porsche did an NFT drop. There's a few other big brands that have done NFT drops and they weren't necessarily well received, even though there was a lot of hype and infrastructure buildup and marketing, but then they didn't do that well and we don't have like a, a good memory of them. So what's your views on how brands can enter Web3 and connect with consumers in the right way? I think really the most important thing, it needs to be authentic, right? Because the, the Web3 space, especially the community knows what's authentic and what not. And I think, actually, um, Beatport is a great example. Like, we've, we've started um, working on the Beatport.io project like two years ago, and um, bringing a, a, a brand like Beatport, which is the like, biggest electronic music platform in the world, into Web3 um, is an interesting use case, right? I mean... Yeah, and I, like I said, I think uh, don't go too big too quick. Uh, listen to the community, build the community, and, and, and you know, take your time with it. Um, and then you're going to find out what the community want because you're going to be asking them because it's going to be a two-way you know, conversation. Um, but if you try and put you know, your kind of traditional Web 2 marketing strategy and blow everything up, it's, it's, it's going to be hard to kind of do that con con conversion. So I would say sort of start small, build with the community, have input, and then, you know, take those learnings and move forward from there, and you can build and scale from there. But it, you can't go into it thinking that you're going to use the same business model or the same marketing strategies as you've got for your, for your traditional Web2 business, because it's completely different. Sometimes, like, creator desires and company objectives are misaligned, probably more often than not. So... Creators are concerned about intellectual property rights and revenue sharing and agency over uh, their branding and how they're perceived and their artistic liberty, right? Whereas businesses tend to be more concerned about generating a product and selling as many of them as possible. So uh, my question to you is, with mass adoption of Web3 or blockchain, or for any company that's trying to pivot into Web3, those questions are gonna come up, right? Intellectual property rights, branding, autonomy, so on and so forth. 
let's look at the Web2 economy or traditional um, creator economies as we know them. And I've got a few stats for you. So currently, 0.33% of YouTube creators earn a full-time income. 94% of medium writers earn under $100 a month. 0.3% of Patreon creators have over 2,000 patrons. 96.3% of freelancers on, on Fiverr make less than $500 a month. It just goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on, right? So how do you address this? What, what is like, do you get where I'm going? Like when people think of Web2, creators think about autonomy, ownership, intellectual property rights. I run a podcast and those are things that I don't have at all with my company. Whatever I do, even though they're a Web3 company, they own it, even after I leave. So for all of you three that are building platforms that are creator-centric and Web3 focused, how do you kind of bridge that gap? Yeah, I mean, it's a tough one. Um, yeah, but it's too long of a question, isn't it? Yeah, no, 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 it's good. Um, but yeah, I, th I think I think that's that's the what we keep talking about about the community, right? It's, if if you look at these traditional like YouTube and Facebook and stuff, that's a kind of audience builder, right? And all anyone's cared about is views and reach and impressions and stuff. But you know, you need to go deeper into that and, and start building these communities. And that's why you know the the younger audience are kind of splitting away from these traditional kind of web to social media platforms. And, and I think in time, if you build those communities from the ground up with, with being authentic and stuff, then that's how you can kind of build from there. Yeah, I think it's like, uh, like it's Kevin Kelly when, when he was taking, talking about the 1,000 fan. It's the same concept. It's about yeah. uh, your fans. You talk directly to your fans, your community. You need only 1,000 fans to be independent. And that's what you can do with, with Web3. And uh, Web2 is not allowing you. So that's, that's it for me. It's the 1,000 fun. You need 1,000 fun. Yeah. And also, I mean, t personally, I get that what gets me excited about Web3 is that it offers all the tools and solutions to actually fix the problems that traditional Web2 has, right? So by moving the assets on chain, you can make it transparent for the creators. Um, you can give them direct revenue, right? Because I mean, the streaming model is broken. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a music creator, you, you own a fraction of a cent per stream, right? And all of that can be solved and fixed uh, through Web3, so I think, that's the exciting part that we're starting this journey with. Right. Julia, I know you said uh, behind stage that your company is kind of doing some stuff with diesel, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that? So like uh, diesel uh, it's, uh, would like to be really in Web3. So we help them to build a really strong concept using music at the center of their strategy. So diesel is acting like a discovery label um, discovering um, emerging or breakthrough artists to give voice of, of their art. And with that, they're doing few, they did a few drops with us that was a really big success, but we're going to plan a, a big drop uh, beginning of September that is going to be a digital drop. So um, I think now the future is only, not only, the big part is digital as we discussed before uh, and behind the scene. It's giving experience, utilities, what the community wants. Like they want to have a, a VIP experience. They want to have something from the brand, not only the garments, but they want to be part uh, of the family, diesel family. So that's, that's what we're doing. And, uh, and it's a long process, like a lot of education to the sea level, as, as we discussed before. And, um, and that there is a lot of opportunities for brands to be out there and work with the music industry and do like really creative and also talk to different communities, like not only to their fan, but to new fans that they never heard about these. Like for example, with the first drop, we sold like 50% of, of, 50 of it to, Turk, to a Turkish community that they, they don't have this store there. So they really, they can talk really to different communities that they didn't talk before. Um, I, I know we all kind of talked about the Porsche 
or the Porsche NFT drop and varying perspectives. Most of us think it wasn't really a success. Can you kind of get into the nitty gritty and tell me like what are your actual platforms doing? Like what do you have planned that's digital, a mix of physical or real life experiences and then there's some NFT associated with it. What do you have planned? Uh, <clears throat> so with Beatport.io, um, we're doing kind of 10 curated drops over the next few months. Uh, each of those drops is um, combined with a, with a physical event um, and we'll be building utility for, for around that as well. Because I think, especially for like dance music and our fans, that's where we got to meet the audience where they are, right? And that's in the clubs and that's in the festivals and stuff. So we need to be able to show that we're not just pushing a kind of uh, an NFT or a digital asset. It's like you've got a digital asset, but actually you can come backstage here or you can come out for dinner with us or you can get first access into the after party, things like that. So it's actually tangible and it's like, oh, right, this actually means something and it's giving me back something in the real world. Uh, and I think that as a, as a first step, uh, will help kind of make people realize that, yeah, this isn't just it's a kind of digital asset. There's, there's, there's real life benefits, real world benefits to this as well. Yeah, I think also it's about the experience, as you said. It's not only the physical to be at the party, but also to get them from the NFT or the creator or something. Like, for example, tonight is going to play Christina Lazic, and she's going to drop uh, during the performance on public pressure. And uh, two of the She's going to raffle two, and two winners that can, that they have two hours with her, with her and how to learn how to d DJ. So this is a good example of a good, a really cool utility that an, a creator can do. So there is a lot of, not only physical, but really cool experience that you can give uh, in the NFTs actually. Yeah. And also to give you, give you one more example. So. Um, the, the first project we're going to launch with, um, Nachts, is also going to have a really interesting physical uh, or digital experience where we're going to connect um, the physical artworks to uh, uh, the digital artworks to, to the physical artworks and um, going to have an exhibition at Berlin Art Week uh, in September so fans can really experience uh, both, right? And the, the NFT is also a, an access token to the exhibition. And kind of marrying these worlds and creating a holistic experience, um, that's really exciting for the, for the fans. From the tech side, um, what are some of the benefits of NFTs for creators and businesses that make them sticky? And I kind of approach that from, if any of you are avid NFT collectors, you know that like, Board Ape Yacht Club did a drop, right? And then you got a dog, and then you got a mutant ape, and then you got something else, a piece of metaverse land, right? NFT projects, the so-called blue chips, got into this kind of process where they did airdrops, they did derivatives, they were just doing things to maintain floor value or to keep the project sticky. So that's cool, but it got played out, it doesn't really work anymore, but I know that you guys said something about like altering metadata and how you can make one NFT collection kind of have multiple utility without having to do endless drop after drop after drop after drop to keep users and bring in new users. But I, uh, like for example, as, as we mentioned, like it's the mutable metadata, so you can uh, change the content of your NFT as a creator multiple times during the whenever you want so you can drop to you to your fan what your 1000 fan a new song every two weeks so you can drop anything so you can change the the, the, the data can change inside the nfts and as a creator it's a really good tool to allow you to always engage your with your fan base uh, directly so i think that's something amazing for creators she said it all. Got some. No, yeah, I think. I mean, the, the, that's what you know. Why, personally, the the Polkadot ecosystem is so exciting, right? Like the guys from Kilt, they have a have a wonderful solution for that. And there's yeah, like the verification that we we are using, and that's something else. Like uh, there there are few things that, as a creator, are really important to have. It's not easy for the user to get it. So I think it's wrong to to explain to the user the complexity, but you, ne you need to tell to your fan, every week you're going to have a gift from me. 
So you engage them, that's it. But they don't need to know how, like mutable metadata, because only the word is already complex to say, so I wouldn't sell them. No, but apart from the technical side and technical solutions, um, it's really about re-owning that, as an artist, to re-own that connection with your fan, right? And how do you utilize that connection? What do you offer your fans? How can you make that a two-way conversation and really take them uh, to new experiences? So community is something I hear all three of you mentioning a lot. And you hear a lot about community and Web3 circles and crypto also. Are community members and users stakeholders? Should they be stakeholders? Absolutely, absolutely. I think for us, especially Beatport.io, as an example, is really all about um, electronic music culture. And the culture is made up by the community. So it's really important to take the community on that journey and um, make them a stakeholder. How? How do you gauge that? And how do you give governance to people that are within your community? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Well, first of all, it's really about kind of giving them a, a voice, right? So in that, in that sentence or in that, in that instance, the first NFT gives you access to f future experiences, right? So they become a stakeholder in that community. Um, we, you know, we ask them, what do you want to see next? How can you uh, be more involved? Like really also opening up um, the community to other projects and creators to, um, yeah, to propose drops that they want to do. So really make it a co-creation. So on Beatport, would um, fans creating the art for an upcoming album or um, choosing which album should be remastered or where they want the actual like concerts to take place. Is that something that stakeholders could do? Yeah, yeah, 100%. And again, like it's, it's all experimentation, right? Um, and so a couple of the projects that we've got coming up, we're going to create kind of completely new labels from, from the, the existing labels and, you know, get the community involved and have them be part of the, the, yeah, like you said, the artwork where you do your events, which tracks you want, which samples we want to use, and, and just build that and then see, you know, is this working? Do people really care? Or is it something that we can really build on? And if, if it is, then that's something that we'll try and build in to everything that we do. Um, and I think that's the, the, again, that's the, kind of the best way of doing it. It isn't just saying that this is what we're doing 100% straight down the line, because it, you, there's going to be a lot of learnings that we need to take. And, and we've got to listen to that and really kind of take action more pro and process what we're, what we're getting from our audience and the community from that side. Yeah, and I think also the beauty of new communities, because uh, with, mu with music, you can also talk to different communities, like, for example, uh, we are talking with the gaming community, so we use music as a cross-utility project and using the music to enter new games. So that's something that communities want, uh, actually, in Web3, so we are really into it. And, uh, like, uh, we have a few games, they, they, every Monday they play and the winner is going to get new NFTs with new music. So it's something that really you can uh, talk with new communities. And also go the extra mile, right? So um, the first project we're going to um, be dropping is about the Berlin techno scene, right? So that's a very special community in itself. We're going to give a little tease tomorrow at the after party here uh, with Nacht. But then also the next project is um, He, She, They, which is an LGBT plus community. And to really go the extra mile and um, Beatport did a documentary with them and to really, you know, show the community that you care about them to really dive deep and, and then, yeah, work out new steps together. Great. Any questions from the audience? Anyone got questions about Web3, NFTs, all that good stuff? Okay. The metaverse and artificial <laughs> intelligence. That's, that's all the talk, right? So what's your thoughts on that? How is it? Metaverse are kind of empty at the moment. <laughs> so, no, like, uh, as public pressure, we have a huge community, Web3 community, and uh, they built a public pressure village on Minecraft. So we have uh, 70 builders, and now the village is huge. It takes like six hours with an avatar to go around. So it's again going back to community. Communities likes to be involved. 
to take decisions. We did like a party for, with Diesel on, in Diesel House, and all the community Web3 from Polkadot was there because they built it. There was in pause as you have in other metaverse. So I really a believer that, again, they need to decide what to do because that's Web3. It's about their relationship with, with your community. So that's a really good example that uh, we, we did it. And we still, like, we have another, we plan Fashion Week there with other brands too in September. But we have users going there because they build it. So it's about that. That's why I think metaverse is something that is going to happen, but you need to involve more the user. It shouldn't be pa a passive user as Web2 is doing. Yeah, for us with Beatport.io, it's further down the roadmap, right? So we've done experimentation on Decentraland, working um, in the music district there. But it's really about um, first kind of having your, yeah, launching the platform and then later on the roadmap, we're going to go deeper into the metaverse. And so it's got, it's got to be a, a good experience, right? And I think um, a lot of the time it's probably not quite what we would expect and therefore you know uh, it's something again like you don't jump into you take your time figure out the best strategy and and do it well otherwise you know you have probably only got one or two shots and then you know no one's going to come back so it's, it's really important to make sure that it's a really good experience for people um so yeah that's why it's further down the line i think it's going to be very interesting now with the apple vision pro coming out i think that's going to be a huge game yeah, changer I right i think that will enable completely new experiences because in my opinion if you try to recreate the real world in the metaverse it's a little bit pointless right you, you rather want to be you know at a rave experiencing it but i think with something like apple vision pro you can create completely new experiences and that will be exciting yeah, I agree. Do you not think cost will be prohibitive to uptake? Well, again, you know, of course, it's a very steep cost to entry, but once this hits mass adoption and more people are, you know, entering these experiences, the price will go down. So I think in, in a year or two, it will be a lot more affordable. Mm -hmm. How's growth on each of your platforms? How are your daily active users? How much interest do you see in what you do? Um, and I'm curious, why did you choose Polkadot? Most of the kind of DAP users and Web3 community, and no offense, a lot of them are on Ethereum. And most people that are crypto native tend to have their first experience with Bitcoin or on Ethereum. So what drove the three of you to build on Polkadot? Scalability, uh, energy consumption, that's a really big part for creators. Because when we start public pressure more than two years ago, when I started going around to the creators, like, oh my God, blockchain, there is a really high energy consumption, and Polkadot is uh, the best blockchain for that. And uh, of course, people, people that are, that are in Polkadot, uh, we call it family. It's our family now, and uh, we love Polkadot. Yeah, so it's the same with us, the, the, the kind of fact that it's the greenest. Um, and for us, we obviously spoke to a lot of uh, people before we kind of made the decision, um, but yeah, they've got a great team. Um, they got it. They get music. They get what we're trying to do, um, and you know the ecosystem, the amount of people that we can kind of talk to and work with uh, was really exciting for us. What's dropping on your platform in the next month? That uh, why should everyone go visit uh, your platform? We are going to have four DJs from with BPM Festival. We are going to have a drop four drops. They're really exciting with utilities uh, with the festival, and Diesel September, and uh, yeah, these are the exciting one. I have to say BPM and uh, Diesel. The, the so we uh, will announce the first drop uh, in a couple of weeks, um, and the drop will happen at the end of this month. Um, but yeah, it, it should be, uh, hopefully it will turn a lot of heads. There's a, a lot of pretty high uh, caliber artists in there that you wouldn't expect, uh, and the whole narrative around it is, is, is really quite special. Um, and then from there, we'll, we have Hishi Day, um, and again, we're, we're, we're tying our kind of release of these drops around um, events. So we'll be at Korea Blockchain Week, Web Summit, NFT MIC, Art Basel. So each, each kind of main moment for the Web3 community will be doing a big event and, and doing a drop surrounding that. 
for creators, what would you say, um, what's important to consider when onboarding them into the Web3 space? Like, I don't code, most people aren't writing smart contracts. It's a, it's a bit daunting, right? Like, yeah. getting literate to then transition into Web3 as a creator, it's a challenge, so. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's one of the reasons we're, we're, we've chosen this strategy for, for Beatport is because we want to work with people that we know and we trust and we have, they have good teams and we want to build out kind of, uh, kind of almost sort of turnkey solutions with them so that we can then onboard, you know, more people uh, and more labels and more artists in an, in an easier way. And it's, and it's, but at the beginning, you know, for sure, what we found is, is it's a lot of hand-holding a lot of like reassurance, um, but I think in time, once once you know you've got proof of concept with with a lot of these kind of projects, then it's far easier to bring people in because they've seen right this works, this person's doing it, let's get involved. Yeah. Also, you know, talking about mass adoption, so Beatport has like more than 1.5 million DJs and producers, more than 100,000 label. Uh, 42 million yearly active users. So it's really about kind of first working with some of the you know biggest labels and artists, and then bringing the rest of the community along. Yeah, and also it's about the the people that you're having your team explaining to the labels uh, what's the benefit you you get uh, coming to the platform and on, on Web3. So. We are, in, we are in talk and working with a lot of big labels and they're happy to work. It's, it's the way that the narrative again, I go back to the narrative. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's education, right? And it's still education. I mean, it's the same with, with how people started, you know, in 2001 when the MP3 revolution came around and everyone was using vinyl, everyone was like, what the hell is this? There's no way we're going to do this. And it took a lot, you know, a lot of time to get the big labels on. And then once the big labels were on, people started seeing it. The technology evolved. And then, you know, we're, we're here where we are now. Um, and, that, and it's just going to be the same process for this. And offering the creators new tools, right, to really show them what they can do differently and how they can, like, enter Web3, making them part of that. All right. Anyone have any questions? That was great. There's actually one there. One question. Someone there, one question. You want to stand up and just yell it out? Hi, my name is Reinhold. Uh, I work in law, and I just have one question. Maybe it's a bit too legal, technical. Probably. Yeah, but <laughs> just generally, um, you mentioned things like fractionalization. Maybe you need. To you mentioned things like fractionalization of IP, and uh, I just wanted to know. Um, while IP law is harmonized internationally, I still think it's quite challenging to go these new technical ways, whereas the law is you know, not fully adapted to this, like to work with smart contracts, whereas traditionally you would have these uh, you know, complex legal structures with uh, music companies acting as intermediaries. Uh, it must be challenging. Do you, can you say a few words how you approach these? Yeah, I mean, th that, th I think that's why okay. kind of no one's fully done it, right? Because uh, th this is a completely new space. Um, even most legal teams are like, meh, I don't know how to do this yet. So it, it, again, it will take time, and it just it just requires kind of the best minds in the business to be able to work through it. But I'm I'm sure like they will get there. I'm, I've I've got no doubt about that. But no, yeah, for, so sorry. Like and also like I agree, but a lot of labels want to 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 work on the IP level. That's 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 for sure. But to find the right technology and the the, the right. Uh, Low to do it, as you said, because it's a complex uh, things to do. The IP, the IP and ro royalties. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. There's a lot in store for Web3. Obviously, uh, Rome wasn't built in a day, so uh, I, I think we're all three bullish on the space, aren't we? Yes. All right. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. Thank we you. Appreciate it.